I just want to say a couple of things. I started the fund that I managed in 1955 when Benjamin Graham said he was going to retire. And uh, I liked Graham very much. And uh, one of the people who rested with him said, Walter, if you start a fund, I will, uh, I, uh, I will put money in it. So I said it was a good idea. And we got uh, 19 partners, and they, most of them put $5,000 in, and we started off with 19 partners and $100,000. I did want to say I never worked with Goldman Sachs. Uh, my job was basically with Loeb Rhodes, which uh, was kind of related to the Lehman family, I suppose. But anyway, I just wanted you to know that. So I started in 1955, and I stayed in the in, – uh, in the field until 2003, and my 2003, my 2001, I think. I'm not quite sure how. And I, what I know is that my son turned to me one day and said, "Dad, I can't find any cheap stocks." And I said, "At my age, let's go out of business." And I just know that knew that the market was going to bubble because of, uh, the high tech stocks were acting very crazily. And when these things happen, you find that you have to work about three years to catch up to all the things that went wrong in the previous three years. And uh, life's too short for that. And I enjoy investing. And I would make one other comment. Uh, actually, I was written up by Forbes magazine, uh, and it came out, I think the issue was uh, February 11th. And you might find that interesting. And uh, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. Uh, even if I don't answer them right, you tell me. Can you just talk okay. a little bit about your, your relationship with Ben Graham and how it started? Your relationship with Ben Graham. Well, what happened was I went to work in 19... My father had lost his, jo uh, lost his job, and there was really no money in the family. And so I got a job as a runner and at uh, Carl M. Loeb and Company, which became Loeb Roads later on, was a big brokerage firm, but it was small when I went there. And then they put me into the cashier's department. And uh, a year later, I went, I thought I'd already get a little more money. I was making $15 a week, and I thought I could get a little more. So I asked about it, if, if I could get into the security analysis department. Uh, which is, as they called it, the statistical department in those days. And I spoke to the partner who had gotten me the job as a runner, and I said, could I become a, a security analyst instead of a statistician? And he said, no. I think maybe I had no money and I couldn't bring in brokerage fees. And in those days, all commissions were fixed so that the wealthy people send their family in and they would get fixed commissions. Now, of course, it's a very competitive field. So anyway, he said, no, you can't, you can't do that. But he said, there's a book called Security Analysis by Benjamin Graham. And if you read that book, you won't need anything else. So I got hold of the Security Analysis and it was a very good book. And uh, I found that Benjamin Graham, who had written the book, uh, was a customer of Loeb's. And I could see the stocks they owned. And uh, it, it seems that Loeb would send me uh, to what called the New York Stock Exchange Institute. They were trying to teach the employees on a small basis how the stock exchange worked. And uh, they also, Benjamin Graham, taught a course in statistical analysis. And I took two of his courses, security analysis and advanced security analysis. And I thought Graham was wonderful. He's sort of like Warren Buffett. I mean, you, you, you know, see Graham, you understand the way he thinks, and, and it works. And incidentally, after I worked for Graham for a number of ye years, uh, they, uh, uh, he, he, I'm in his office, but he gets a phone call from his lawyer to say that government employees insurance, which he had bought for a million he bought that day for a million seven hundred thousand dollars, and he turned to me and he said, "Water, if this doesn't work, we can always liquidate and get our money back." That shows what sometimes happens when you make a good purchase. You don't always realize how great it's going to be. So I'm open to questions if you have, and uh, I don't know if I answered anything so far, but ask me what. And if I don't know, I'll tell you. 
Well, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about how do you choose stocks? How, what process do you follow uh, to choose stocks? Well, I like to buy stocks that are hitting new lows. I like to look at the stocks. I, I, incidentally, I find Value Line very helpful because I don't have a computer, and it's easy to see the statistics. Uh, then when I see the statistics, then I can sort of make a judgment about the company. I don't really talk to the management. Uh, back in the days when I started, back at, I, I was in World War II. I enlisted the day after Pearl Harbor, and I was sent overseas to Iran. And I'm just telling you this little background. In life, you sometimes are affected by what happens. Um, we wanted to keep Russia in World War II. In World War I, they, they collapsed and the Germans beat them. And, and we were afraid that in World War II, that this would happen because the Russians were being beaten by the Germans. And they decided that we couldn't give them equipment through the Bermansk and the North Sea of, uh, of, of Russia. Uh, so that we, we decided to open a second front, as it were, by setting up, we had a, 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 a truck assembly plant there. We were the first troops there. We had ordnance people who put the trucks together. You loaded them up with supplies. You drove it to the northern part of Iran and then turned it over, the everything in the truck, to the Russians. And the Battle of Stalingrad was going on. And that was probably the place where the Germans took a big beating because they never got any further. And by doing this, we kept the Germans uh, from going into back into France. And uh, as you remember, a couple of years later, we invaded France, uh, and partly because the Germans weren't able to be there. So I felt that it was a very important thing we were doing. But because we weren't being killed, nobody knew anything about the Persian Gulf Command. And you might find it an interesting thing. So when I came back, I was there about a year and a half, and then I applied to go to officer's candidate school. So they sent me back to the United States. And in the United States, uh, the Signal Corps was really uh, the place where you learned about uh, uh, you learned about uh, communications, and I went in, and because I had enlisted, uh, I they they uh, they sent me there, and I got training, and I was training I, uh, about the 15th of December. Remember, Pearl Harbor was only December 7th, and on January 31st, I was on my way to Washington D.C. I'm not so sure if you're aware of it, but before Pearl Harbor, the Americans were training in the South because it was warmer there, and uh, so that when we when when the war broke out, we didn't have any communications to speak of, and they were short code clerks. So I became a code clerk in, in Washington D.C. back in 1942, and I worked there for about six months, and then the Army founded a company called the 833rd Signal Service Company. It was a bunch of crackerjack ham operators people who really knew something about the communications. And since I was, they made me a sergeant, and I was kind of in ch charge of some of this stuff. And I'm only telling you this so you get a little background, because after I became an officer and they sent me, I didn't, I, um, Ben Graham knew about me because I, I would send him a postcard from time to time where I was, and he wrote me after World War II, uh, and I'm still in the Army. I'm at the Pentagon in Washington. And they, uh, he asked me when I was going to get out. I said, well, I can get out pretty soon because I've been in for four years. And he said, well, he is losing a security analyst uh, who is going to work with his father. Would I be a security analyst? And I said, yes. I was very thrilled about it. And I went to work for him in the beginning of 1946. And in 1955, when Graham decided to retire, that's when I went into the business myself. You know, what process did you follow to minimize any mistakes? I know mistakes are unavoidable in valuations and uh, security uh, collection, I guess. Uh, what steps did you follow to minimize any mistakes? I don't like to lose money. And therefore, I try to buy stocks which I think are somewhat protected on the downside. And then the upside sort of takes care of itself. So the main thing, I think, is to look for companies which don't have a lot of debt, 
and I don't like the idea of 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 people. Uh, uh, well, I'll put it this way. I'd like to get their annual reports. And you can see a little bit about, from the proxy statements and the annual report, how much stock the directors own, who owns a fair amount of stock, and also the history of the company. And I thought uh, the idea of buying a company with a large amount of debt, even though I, uh, it, it could work out well because of the leverage, I don't like it, so I look for companies that are selling new, at new lows. Well, when you buy a stock at a new low, it usually has problems. So I don't like debt. Uh, debt gets people in a lot of trouble, as you know, if you read about MBIA and these other companies that have lent money and, and then find out they're in really in trouble. So I like buying companies which are usually a rather simple capital. They don't have a lot of debts. Uh, they have management owns a fair amount of stock. Uh, they are they have a history about them too. You look at a you look at a company and you see how long has it been in business, and uh, what kind of business are they in? Now I was never very good at judging people's character as such. If you go to a, 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 a talk to a management, they may be charming people. They may be very nice but you don't know anything about them. So I found it really was better for me to look at the numbers than to try to look at the people themselves. Uh, and it, it's, it serves you, particularly if they don't have a lot of debt. If they don't have a lot of debt, uh, usually that's fairly safe. Now, once in a while, a company, after you own it, <laughs> decides they're going to buy another company and they issue a lot of debt. But if you look at the background of a company and see their history, uh, and that's where value line is somewhat helpful because they usually have 10 or 15 year backs, so you can see where the company was and where it is today. And uh, I don't know if I answer your questions, but the idea is I don't like to lose money. Now, when the stock goes down, um, do you automatically buy more or you reconsider the purchase. So when you buy a stock and the I price goes down, you keep buying and it goes you, down. Yeah, you like you, I mean, if you like it at 10, you're going to like it more at 5. Well, what happens is uh, lots of times uh, you buy a stock and if it's uh, having a problem, which is the reason the stock is depressed, it can go lower. And uh, what you want to do is to be satisfied that buying it at a lower price is a good idea. So you look to see how much debt they have. You look at the past history of the company. Uh, you see it may have, it, the stock may have gone from 12 to 100, and it goes down from 100 to 70. You say, boy, it's down from 100 to 70. That's great. But you forget that a few years before it was selling at 10. So you, what you're really trying to do when you invest is to protect your capital. Now. Different people have ways of doing that. Sometimes they they may think they have better information than you have, which they may have. But I just don't like losing money, and therefore I try to protect it. And the way I do that is if I like a company and I think it's a good little company, I'll buy more on the way down. And uh, if you're a stockbroker, most stockbrokers do not like to recommend stocks that are going down. Uh, because psychologically, their customers doesn't like it. If they pay some, buy the stock at that thirty dollars a share, and then it goes down to twenty-five, they don't call their customer up and say, "Hey, you ought to buy more at twenty-five," and then it goes down to twenty. So, quite often, the broker will not tell you to buy more stock, although it psychologically is good. But for many people who are not in the field. They get very nervous. It goes for 30 to 20. You lost a third of your money. So if it goes back up to maybe 30 again, they may call the customer and say, well, the stock you went down a lot, but it's back where it was, so maybe you should sell it. I don't, don't really like the idea of selling stock that just goes back to where I paid for it. Quite often, stocks are on the way down, and that's why I buy them. They're having problems. But then I like to have, I usually like to own, try to get 50% profit if I can. The net result of that is you buy a stock at 30 and then it goes up to, to 50, I'd probably sell it if it was long term. 
that stock can go to $200 a share, and I've seen that happen. So you have to be a little willing to make mistakes. Uh, but I don't really like losing money, and that's one of the reasons that I tend to uh, not uh, like debt. So the stock goes down. How can you tell it's not a value trap? How do you, how do you tell that the stock may not uh, recover? It may never recover. Maybe something has changed that uh, will make the stock, I guess, a long-term losing proposition. So how can you protect, I guess? How can you tell if it's a value trap or a, a normal, I guess, stock price decline will come back again? I, I tend to like stocks that are selling below book value. I also like stocks that are selling uh, at a, at a, at a, uh, with, with very little debt. Debt gets, gets a lot of people in trouble. All you have to see is these, uh, the, the, the ATM machines where people run into huge amounts of debt. They can't pay it. They go bankrupt. It's a, it's, I've been very concerned about borrowing money. And uh, I think that's one of the things that people forget, that debt creates a lot of problems, and therefore you try to avoid debt as much as you can. And uh, if you buy a company and you look at the balance sheet, you, and the other thing you should do besides looking at the value line is get hold of the annual report. Read their report. See what the balance sheet shows. See where the, what is the history of the company. Uh, and you might find that it's... Uh, uh, they're having problems, and the reason they're having problems is that what they, they their uh, product is not very good. In which case, you probably wouldn't own it. But I do find that if you get a stock that's selling at below, considerably below book value, and and it has a, a good history over the last 20 years, uh, it gives you a, a certain amount of confidence in it, particularly if the debt is is more and if the management itself owns a fair amount. Uh, talk to us about the margin of safety. Uh, how it came about, uh, how it has evolved over time, uh, what margin of safety Ben Graham was using, and whether you still use what he was using, or you have changed, I guess, your views, and you've uh, adapted with the times. I think a margin of safety is if your book value is considerably higher than the market price. You get a margin of safety there. It doesn't guarantee that you'll be right, but it just means that you've got something there. If it gets low enough, somebody may want to buy the company. Uh, so the, it, the management itself has an interest in making a company a success. So there, it isn't as if you're fighting the management. The management wants to be a success too. So you're in the same field, but for some reason they run into some trouble. Uh, their product may be, uh, you, uh, it, it's one of the unfortunate things that when you get a, a thing like the asbestos, uh, it turned out asbestos is bad, and then they get sued and their companies get into a lot of trouble. So you try not to get into a company where it has, uh, shall we say, uh, problems, uh, in, 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 and that may be true of the drug industry too, where the people are being sued because they have a, uh, a product which doesn't work. My question is, um, have you ever made a mistake because of your emotions? Um, ben Graham obviously talks a lot about controlling emotions when investing. I'm wondering if at any point in the past you've made a mistake because of a poor emotional decision? Um, and if so, maybe you could just share that with us. Um, and if not, um, maybe you could just um, explain to us um, you know, how you control your emotions when investing and, and you know, What's, what's the best way for somebody um, to do that? Well, number one, I try to, and I, Graham, I think, made the point, too. I try not to get emotional about stocks. Uh, I don't get emotional. Uh, one of the reasons I don't really talk to managements is managements have a way of, of presenting the, the, the facts the way they want you to see them. And, uh, and I'm not a terribly good judge of people. Warren Buffett really is a remarkable man in that respect. He's very, very good about deciding who is good and who isn't. I like to think that he, that's why he likes me, but uh, I, I just think that what you try to do is to keep your emotions out of investing. 
and you try to look at the thing logically, not the way you want to have it. Uh, I think that, for instance, um, the getting electric cars uh, would be a great idea, uh, but they don't seem to have made them in such a way that you don't need gasoline. Someday somebody's going to invent it, and then it's going to be a big hit. But I don't feel comfortable buying, say, an automobile company because at some future time somebody's going to invent something that will make it better. I'd rather buy the things the way they are rather than the way you think they may be at a later date. Definitely. So, so basically, um, instead of being, you know, making speculative decisions, you like to, uh, you know, invest in sort of known, uh, in, in sort of companies that are known, that are, pr that have proven, that have a proven track record and, and sort of that, that I guess I that's I think the that's true. I, I think that's true. I try to not be an emo involved emotionally. Warren Buffett told me an interesting story a while back, and, and he tried to com com control his emotions, and he did it by testing things. The American Broadcasting Company, which is still around, but it's ABC now, it was anyhow, uh, he told a broker, uh, the stock was selling at $30 a share. I'm not exactly, in the field, but it's about that. And Warren said to him, look, I'd like to buy 100,000 shares, but I, I want to pay 29. And if I can't buy the stock at 29, next day it's going to be 28. So sure enough, the next day, the guy calls up Warren, he tells me this story, and he says, okay, Warren, we can buy 100,000 shares at 29. I said, no, nope, today I'm buying it at 28. Now, I probably wouldn't have done this. I don't think I had as much control of my emotions as Warren did. Warren said he bought that stock at $26 a share. Now, that's controlling your emotions about how important it is and what price you're willing to pay. I do find that putting in stock to buy at a price, and then that's it. And don't, don't have to watch, well, um, the tip is low, it's down a point or it's a half a point. You have a price you want it at, and it may even pay you to have one of the prices where it's, uh, you, you put it in at, uh, at a fixed price and they can't reduce it. Uh, so you may be going away and you'd like to buy the stock, but you don't want to follow it. So you give them it's good till canceled, which I don't know if you know what that term means, CTC. But you give a broker, you want to buy a thousand shares of a stock, good till canceled, period. Now, again, if they pay a, the broke, if, if the company pays a dividend, they automatically reduce the price by the amount of the dividend unless you tell the broker, uh, don't do that. Do not reduce the price if a dividend is paid. I don't know if that helps you. Yeah, that definitely does. Thank you very much. I'd like to know, would you rather buy outstanding companies at fair prices or fair companies at outstanding prices? That's a good question, and uh, I don't think I'd like to buy good companies at, at, at what I think they're worth. I really like, I, I have no buy, problem buying a good company, but I want it at a discount. I'm looking for, to make a profit, and I don't want to lose money. And if you can, at times, once in a while, people get very nervous, and you can buy a good company at a fair price. I, I don't really like I can't generalize because each company is different, but uh, but if you uh, if you want to make a profit, you really want to buy a stock at a price that you think it'll go up, say fifty percent. Now it may take several years for that stock to go up, and then you just have to be patient. Now one day, this goes back to about 1951. You weren't around and so forth, but the fellow came to me and he said, you know, uh, they the company that we're interested in that uh, the, one of the, um, I can't even remember the name of it, it was a, it was a, a, a company uh, that anal analyzed other companies, and he said this particular company said that there's a, there's a method there where they can uh, copy machines, and it's the Battelle Institute in New York, I think it's in New York State, has said this company has great possibilities. Stock was selling. Uh, it, it was selling at about 20, uh, and it had lived well through the depression. It was listed on the exchange. It was a small company, 
And I went into Mr. Graham and I said, you know, this company's got a new product, you know, a copying machine. And he said, well, you know, Walter, we don't really buy stocks like that. Well, of course, it was Xerox. It went up a great deal. And the only consolation I had was that I, it had gone from 20 where we saw it, and it had gone to 50, they would have been out of it. And the fact that it went up to 1,000 to 2,000 after splits, I wouldn't have bought it. Uh, I bought it only because historically there seemed to be an interesting stock. But but it, but he was right that it really you, you didn't know that th that this particular product was going to be such a success. The only thing you could say was the Vettel Institute said that it was good. So what you try to do when I invest is not to lose money, and to do that you usually want to buy stocks that are having problems. And most companies, when they have problems, get some help. It doesn't, you know, the directors are upset, the president is upset, why is the company doing badly? And that's one reason I like companies which have no debt, because then you don't have to worry about paying it off. And uh, then you want to look and see why. It, quite often, the stock market acts emotionally. People act emotionally. Bad news, you know, bad news is, uh, causes trouble. So what you try to do is you try not to get involved with the emotions of buying and selling stocks. And if you're managing money for other people, you've got a responsibility, and therefore you don't want to. And so what we did, we never told our, 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 our limited partners, because we were a, 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 a partnership, we never told them what we owned. Because we felt that that would be, first of all, if we told them what we owned, then people would try to buy the same stock, and you'd have competition. So uh, I, uh, I told this to a fellow who was interested in investing with us. He said, you know, um, he said, oh, what's going to stop you from going to Brazil, taking our money? I said, well, I have no desire to go to Brazil, but if you feel nervous about it, don't invest with us. You know, it, but people have certain emotions, and they wanted to uh, not lose money. And as I say, we didn't tell people what we owned. And one guy came up, uh, and he said, you know, Walter, I can't stand it not knowing what we own. He was an old man, so I said, well, we own some bankrupt bonds of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, which actually turned out very well later. And he said, I can't be in your partnership knowing that. It makes me too upset. So we withdrew. So it, people act emotionally, and if you know what you own, uh, they know what you own, and they look at it and say, oh, I don't like that stock. Then they call you on the phone, and then they say, well, why did you own it? I don't want to hear people complaining. They, were, they trusted me with my, their money. And that's what a lot of the hedge funds do. They don't disclose what they own. Uh, could you comment on, uh, or maybe give us three, three key personality traits that, that you think are essential to being a successful value investor? I think a personality trait I would think would be to be calm, not be too emotional about what you did. Do it intellectually. Uh, I think... If you get emotionally involved in a stock, it affects your judgment. And Ben Graham also had that characteristic. And he didn't like to talk to companies. He felt that they would make they would affect what he how he felt. I, I, different people have their different abilities. If you, you if you have a a kind of a logical part, and you meet a guy who's running a company, and you're talking to him and you're like them, you may feel that you can emotionally buy the stock because you feel comfortable with them. And I, I wouldn't be good enough at it, so I would say I only, only will buy a stock that I think that I think is cheap. And uh, that the, the people who, you know, we have a company up in Canada, I think, called Hollinger. Mr. The, the, Mr. Black was a crook, and uh, he had a big name and a uh, wealthy man. And people bought his securities, and they lost a lot of money. And I don't think I would have gotten involved with him because I, I, I don't think you buy a stock unless it's very cheap. And then you look at the man, and 
I think it's also helpful to get the annual reports of companies. Read the annual reports. See if it fits in with what you think. And look at the results over the years. Uh, and if you, if you see a company that's depressed, and it's usually depressed because they're having trouble earning money. People love to b make money, and if the company is having a problem, uh, that you know may not want to own that stock. On the other hand, it may be a problem, a temporary problem, and not a permanent one. And uh, I do think people act emotionally, and uh, people who advise them also don't like to have problems, so they tend to stay away from these companies, which may be good buys. But again, you try to keep your emotions in control, and you and you look at the facts. And you see where the judge and and, and uh, uh, different people can do things differently. Uh, I don't happen to like the people who go in and they say, "Well, this stock is cheap. We're going to buy it and liquidate it and close it off," and they make themselves money. I couldn't do that. You know, again, you have your per different personalities. Uh, and uh, I, I like companies to be a success, and I've, many stocks that I've sold over the years have gone up a lot after I sold them. I, I, you know, somewhat I sold them, and I don't say, oh, my God, I could have made so much more money, and I didn't. Forget it. You sold them, and, and you go on to something else. So I think emotions have a lot to do with success. The Forbes article okay. written on you says you've lived through 17 recessions. And I was wondering, if we're going into a recession, if you feel that uh, the next recession is any different from the previous ones? I have not tried to get involved with the, with the uh, what's going to happen in business. I, I've tried to stay away from that. Um, I, I, if you ask me, I, I'd say your guess is as good as mine. I don't know if you're going to have a recession that will be – I do think that the politicians don't like to have a recession because it's not too good for them, and they may try to do things to help. But I, I find that I like to buy stocks on the base of what they're worth and not trying to figure out what's, what's, what, what's going to happen uh, in business. It saves me a lot of grief. Do you find that a recession is a better time to buy a stock, to find a cheap stock? Uh, you may have opportunities in, in, in buying a stock. My own feeling is if the stock is cheap, I wouldn't worry too much. And they didn't have debts. They had a nice record, but for some reason or other, the public is emotional. It may give you a great opportunity to buy stocks, uh, and you may take advantage of that. But, uh, but again, uh, I found that not trying to guess what the market's going to do or, what, or, or what's going to happen in the future, I think it's really better if you, uh, if you just buy the companies that, are, that are, you have a good value and then maybe you have to wait a little bit longer. But uh, it, it, it solves a lot of problems for me. Don't try to figure out what, what's going to happen in the, in, uh, in, the, in the securities market or, or in uh, the economic situation. Uh, now, in 1932, 1929, we had this big, tremendous crash. But you could have seen that before. You could have seen in 1926 the stock market was getting higher in 30 crashes. So you had this big break. But you wouldn't have been buying stocks in 1928 because you thought the stock market was too high. So the fact that suddenly it collapsed, uh, you hurt a lot of people. But if you, if you uh, uh, read Ben Graham's book and you see that he's not terribly emotional about what he, what he does, and when he lectured, he did something I thought was very unusual. He talked about stocks which are undervalued, or he thought they were undervalued, and he liked to compare stocks. He took Coca-Cola and colgate palm olive, and, they, and why? Because they appeared the same on the on the, on the uh, financial page. And then he's compared Coca-Cola to... Now, a Coca-Cola was basically a, a, a product company, and Colgate Palmolive uh, 
uh, manage toothbrushes and so forth. And I noticed they're still both around. <laughs> but uh, uh, I thought it was, he used that as a good example, and he and he compared them and so forth. But uh, I just like to buy individual stocks. I'm not saying that that was a great way to go, but I do think it's uh, it's interesting to compare different companies in this. In, in, if you could, in the same field, it might be interesting. One of the companies may be much better than the others, and if you compare uh, it's can't, two liquor companies or two uh, companies that were doing so much the same thing, you might find one is, is selling at a higher price than the other, and you might decide you want to buy the one selling at the lower price. Remember this, I don't like to lose money. I wanted to ask you, whether you feel over the recent years that the market has become more efficient and good values are harder to find because management turns over so much more often now? I think that's a good question. And I think they were the thing called the efficient market in which all stocks sold at, uh, where they should sell at. And I think that there were, in that period, and almost any period, there are differences, and your job as, as an analyst is to see why one stock is selling above another, and uh, if, if one of the, if, I think I like to own companies where they're having problems in that industry, uh, and then you have an opportunity. There may be good companies and some that are not so good, but if they're the, an industry which is having a problem, Look at the companies in it, and you may find a real good buy there. Uh, I think today, because there are so many security analysts, you get a lot more competition than you used to. But I, I, even, I don't think value analysts are really happy about buying stocks that are going down. And sometimes that's the best way to – we used to do that. We'd buy stocks on the way down and sell them on the way up. And uh, the only problem is, is I think it's much more difficult to, to know when to sell than when to buy. Uh, you're dealing with other people's mo money, and that gives you a responsibility. And uh, I must say, I'd, I never associated with some of the people who did illegal things. And that may have been luck, but it also was that these people were interested in taking advantage of others. But if you're dealing with people, and some of them you feel are a little, I won't say not ethical, but, you know, they had some question with them, don't get involved. It's so much easier, you know, they say, if you, if, if you, uh, if, uh, what is it, there was a term for, uh, it's where you, you don't have to remember if, uh, what's happened because you didn't do anything wrong. And I think there are people in Wall Street and other that want to take advantage of you. So you try to be ethical, and uh, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember. I don't know if that's a good advice. I, I, I like it. Mr. Schloss, we were wondering what um, your personal view is on diversification between industries as well as between sort of stocks and bonds. What do you feel about diversification? That's, that's, that's an interesting thing about industries. I really don't have an opinion. Well, I'll just say this. I'm going to stay away from the computer industry because I don't understand it. I'm too old for it. And I know there's a great future in it, but I just don't know how to look at it. So I, I just stay away. So I'm not involved in computer stocks. Um, that doesn't mean they're bad, and if you know your computer business, you may know, you know, one stock is better value than others, but it, it's a field that's changing constantly, and I kind of like companies, I don't know, Campbell's Soup, for example. I don't say you should buy Campbell's Soup. I don't even have to follow it. I'm just saying it's a, it's a staple that's been around a long time, and I think I'm more comfortable with that kind of a company than, than going into new industries. But again, it depends on the person. I don't know, what was the other question? Between uh, stocks and bonds, are you, would you be 100% stock or do you sort of mix between the two? Well, 
There is a problem with that. There, there's over the years, there's an, there tends to be inflationary factor in there. That, and the reason for it is that people want things, government wants things, and they get have debt, and then they, there's a certain amount of inflation. So that owning a bond, unless it's a very uh, high interest bearing bond, you'll never make a lot of money. You get a nice income, and I don't know in Canada if the taxes are very high on dividend income, but I feel more comfortable owning stocks because I think there is growth. There is growth in America, and I think there's growth in Canada, although I must say I'm not really familiar with Canada, but I think it's a great country, and therefore there are opportunities for people to grow. Uh, I don't read much about Canada. You know more about it. You're a Canadian. You know more about Canada than I do. Uh, I just uh, think that growth is very an important thing, and uh, if your taxes are too high, you kind of hurt people from growing. I like stocks better because a deflationary factor in bonds, uh, at the end of the time, you get the most you do is get your money back and you get interest on your money. But you can the, you find very few people that became millionaires by owning bonds. They may inherit it, but they don't make it. But in stocks, you can make a, you can if you happen to hit the right area, uh, you can be very successful. And I think that that for young people like you, I would think that you would focus on stocks rather than bonds. Bonds are for old people. That's my theory. Anyway. Th thank you very much. Could you please discuss your experience raising capital for your personal fund in the 50s as a young fund manager? And uh, any sort of really mistakes or ideas that you would change or things you'd do differently? Uh, uh, I'm not a very aggressive man about by, by going around. And I'll tell you a story about Warren Buffett, which I thought was sort of cute. Uh, Warren, after we, he left Graham Newman, when Mr. Graham decided to retire, he went, and Graham Newman decided to liquidate, he went across the street to see one of the people who lived there, a very nice guy, and his wife, and they had four children, I think, and Warren said, I think I can help you with your investment. And uh, his wife said, oh, you can't. How can you give money to the young guy? He's 20 years old. He's got suntan. And so they didn't. Well, the man's name was Don Keogh, and he went to doubt, and he ended up as president of Coca-Cola. And his wife, who I meet when we sometimes have these meetings, you know, she always thinks about that. Because he was young, uh, and he wanted to have him invest, uh, she didn't think that was a good idea. So you really, when you go into business for yourself, you really probably should work for somebody else first to get the experience of the way it is. And then if you have some money or your family has money, they might give it to you, and then you get your feet wet. You have some experience in this thing. Now, I was lucky in one respect. People had a terrible experience in the 1932 Depression. And they never, they didn't forget it for many years. And uh, I remember this man saying, uh, he's going to put money in. He said, how can you start a fund? Uh, don't you know the Dow Jones it went up to three, it was high with 381, and the Dow Jones now is, two, is 400. And how can you start your business now? I said, well, somebody's offered to put some money in it. But, but the timing was there. But people had long memories. And so what you want to do if you want to have people or clients, you first of all, I think, have to look at the values. And then uh, if you're somebody in your family has some money, maybe they would let you manage it for a while. And you get a feel for understanding what you've got. It's very difficult to start a fund. And uh, I think uh, particularly when you don't want to lose people. You don't want to lose money for people. So... If you like mathematics and you like the idea of investing, I think you can do it. I just think you have to control your emotions. Uh, back to me again. Um, uh, what, um, what is the biggest mistake 
a novice investor. But it's my biggest mistake. I kind of, I kind of forget my mistakes. I must admit, uh, I'd have to think about my biggest mistake. I, I really offhand don't know. I, I, I think you can say, well, the mistakes were different. Uh, that you, you uh, put more money in on a stock than had gone down. Uh, we didn't lose money very often, and I, that's why I kind of wiped it out of my mind. We didn't sometimes buy a lot of stock uh, because we, uh, because uh, I was a little nervous about putting too much money in any stock. So we never put a great too much money. We had a, I don't know, over a hundred stocks most of the time, and that way we had a big diversification. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember what. Well, I'll give you an example of one, and I and I don't even remember the name anymore. Uh, I bought this stock, and uh, it was uh, selling around two dollars a share. And uh, I held it for quite some time, and it was a company that manufactured stuff for the army, and. Um, the man who owned it owned about 80% of the company, and he offered to sell, uh, uh, to buy or take all the stock at about $7 a share. At the time, it had a working capital of 10. And uh, I, I, had, uh, I didn't have much of it, but I had about uh, $100,000 worth of the stock. And I objected. I went. Uh, there was a lawyer who said, "Look, I can handle this if you. I won't charge you a fee, because I want to stop it." So I, he put it in court, and he complained about the way it, the tender offer was made. And uh, he won in the court in the New York State. So then they made an appeal to the next higher court in New York State, the Court of Appeals, I think it's called. And anyhow. He won by a vote of three to one. And now the man said who owned this stock, Mr. Berlin, I remember his name. And uh, he, he said, he, uh, a friend of mine who was an insurance man said, you, you know, uh, you're going to be sued for harassment by this man. Meanwhile, I had about $100,000 in the stock and I sued him for harassment because he lost this. I said, it isn't worth my while. I'll just give in. So I bet with the man, and I took the original price of seven. And of course, at that time, the Reagan administration came in, defense went way up, and I'm sure he was, did very well. But emotionally, I found getting involved in legal action was, an, uh, I didn't like it. I found uh, there are a lot of people that don't mind it, but I found that it was an unpleasant experience. I didn't never really focus on my mistakes, uh, or, or for that matter, on the profits. If I sold a stock and it went up a lot more after I sold it, I, it was out of my mind. Uh, I think what I try to do is, is to avoid the mistake of getting involved with people who were not uh, eth particularly ethical. Uh, there was a man named, uh, I don't remember the man's name, he came out of Canada actually. And he sold a company called Croy Oil, and he had he, he was not supposed to do it without registering it with the SEC. So Croy Oil, uh, he was caught dead, and he was sent to prison. He was made of billions of dollars out of it. And after he got out of prison, he thought he had all this money, and he entertained people. Now that gentleman, whatever his name was, he made it, he made a lot of money out of out of the stock market, but. It's not somebody that I want to associate with. You try to stay with good people. But I can't tell you what my biggest mistake was. How you find the investment environment in Asia, and maybe China in particular, undergoing uh, an industrial revolution right now? Do you have any well, okay. views on that? I have definite feelings about it. And I did spend some time in China, actually, on a tour. I do not buy foreign companies, and uh, that does not include Canada. I have been a little bit in Canada, but basically, I want I want to be protected, and I feel that most countries of the world do not have an SEC. Uh, it's not easy to judge them. 
I think certain companies, countries that insiders know more about what's going on can buy the stock. And I've stayed at ten of way away. I'd, I'd rather buy United States companies because I understand them. I don't really understand foreign companies, and China uh, is, is one of them I don't understand. And I feel very uncomfortable owning a company, and this was true with a good example would be uh, Brazil. With the man there just took over the oil company of, of Chevron or one of the oil companies. He wanted it, so he took it. And I feel that China is in that category. If they, if you get, if you get stock in it, and then all of a sudden the Chinese government says, "Well, we don't, we're going to pay you what we want to pay you," and goodbye. And I, I feel comfortable owning stock where I feel I have some protection. So I tend not to get involved with European companies where I don't understand them particularly. Their annual report is in German or French or something. So I tend to buy American companies. That doesn't mean I'm right. It's just that I, I feel comfortable because I understand the situation and I don't understand another company. Thank you very much for your time today. You touched earlier on the example of Xerox in its early days and the difficulty of knowing when to sell a successful investment. I think you noted that you find it easier to decide when to buy and in some instances have sold out of very good investments too early. Could you talk to us a little bit about with a value play that has been a successful investment, how you know when to sell and whether you tend to sell a stock in its entirety or sell it in small components along the way? So basically, uh, Mr. Frost, question. how do you know when to sell? Good question. I think it's uh, I would say I don't know when to sell. Uh, I, I, I don't I, I think basically when a stock gets to be vulnerable in that if, if you pay a stock you paid fifty dollars a share for the stock and it's hundred dollars a share, uh, I'd probably sell it because I made a hundred percent profit and I don't want to worry about it. And I and I and but we did it Graham Dubin where I worked and I lost would sell on the scale. You wouldn't sell it all at one price. I'd sell some at, at, at maybe eighty five, depending how long I held it. I usually we held the stock for usually about three years. We didn't sell it just because you bought it, you didn't sell it. So that so that you had a time where you got a few reports, you read about them and you see what the company has been doing. And when you get a profit, uh, I mean, I like profits, but I, 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 don't, I don't have any formula for saying, well, if the stock goes from 50 to 100, I automatically sell it. You look and see it in the meantime, but you, because remember, the stock has a down, there's a downside to it too. So the stock gets up high enough, there's a lot of, there's a certain amount of vulnerability. You bought a stock at 50, it goes to 100, but you say, I'm not going to sell it, and then it goes down to 50. You feel kind of stupid, and you didn't take advantage of it. So that I tend to sell it on the way up, and that is a problem: is when do you sell a stock? And I have here made a comment which I think might be interesting to you. Uh, ben Graham wrote uh, uh, in his uh, in his uh, third edition of. Security Analysis, which came out in 1951. You can get it at the library. And in there, on page 536, he discussed the difference between price and value. And on page 726, he says, special situations, and he discusses them. And I use that as an example. I talked up at Columbia once, Columbia University, and I told them about McDonald's. McDonald's had come down a lot. It was selling at fourteen dollars a share. You know the restaurant chain. It was selling at, at about fourteen, and it bent out from about thirty-five. And you know there were always some problems with these chains that things can happen. So I took it and I said, well, I think it's selling at fourteen now. And I use Graham's formula, and his formula, I'll read it to you because I thought it was interesting. He says, let G be the expected gain and points in the event of success. 
let L be the expected loss in points in the event of failure. And let C be the expected chance of success expressed as a percentage. Let Y be the expected time of holding in years, and P be the current price of the security. This is an algebraic formula. And you can make your own judgment. The beauty about this particular one, you could use any figures you wanted to, but, you're, but the idea was, what is the formula? And what you do is you use... Uh, the, you, uh, in this case, I said, I think McDonald's is worth 22, selling at 14. So you're going to make, if you buy it at 14 and then sell it at, 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 20, at, at 22, you've made eight points. And that, what is the chance of success? So I use that, and I said, it's 75% chance of success if we go to 22. And then I... You multiply that times uh, 100% minus C, which is to be the expected chance of success expressed as a percentage, and it comes out at 600, that is 75% would be 600 minus 50, and then you divide that by 14, and the denominator was 14, and you'd say it'll take two years to work. So you ended up with a formula of 550 for the, oh, the, the um, numerator, 28, 14 times 2 is 2 years, is 28, and it comes out of 19.6% as a return per year. So you make a 19.6% on a return per year. The beauty of this thing was you make up your own minds. You take a stock, you, you estimate what you think it's worth, and then you multiply it out and use that formula. And if you get that ed ed edition, uh, the third edition of Graham, of, of, of uh, the security analysis, which came out in 1951. And the reason I mention this is because Ben was working on this book, and he turned to me and he said, Walter, I've got a lot of things in the appendix. You let me know if there's anything in there that I should put in. And I've picked this particular a thing which I thought was interesting because you can make up your own mind what you think the company is worth and then see whether how long it would take to do it and it's just a judgment fact but it's a great experience uh, just one other very quick okay. one in terms of asset allocation you have noted a fondness for um, with asset allocation you've said that you like stocks over bonds generally how much would you allocate I, I, to an individual stock, what is the maximum percentage of a portfolio, in your experiences, that you would well, allocate to one name? Bit, it, it tends a little bit on how wealthy or how much you want to put into a stock. If you only have a few stocks, you could. Uh, I use diversified. I had a hundred stocks, uh, and that way you didn't have one stock that had too much. I would say. If it's really a good thing, you really liked it very much, you might put 20% in one stock. I don't think I'd put more than 20%. So just figure you've got a million dollars and uh, how, you're going to sp how you're going to invest it. You, and you like something, you put $200,000 in. That's a lot of money. But if you put in $500,000, you, you risk in half the, your debt worth. So you have to limit how much money you want to put into it. And if you're managing other people's money, you don't want to have them nervous about it. So you may put in less than that. You put 10% in. So again, it depends on how strong, how, how optimistic you are about your judgment. And another thing I think would be fair to say, if you feel that this society, for example, when we had this, the tech, the tech the period where there were these people were buying tech stocks way up, uh, and it was, it was dangerous. And I read a book by a Mr. Perkins, and he talked about the bubble, the, uh, and you can probably get it in the library, and he talked about the bubble of this thing, and I thought, you know, the guy makes sense. So that I was, I'd actually shorted a few stocks, which I normally don't do because I find Shorting stocks is upsetting to me. I don't like to do it because you're risking your capital. But uh, I thought that the, the Perkin book is worth looking at. And certainly, I would say Graham, uh, Benjamin Graham's 
uh, I like that third edition. It came out in 1951 before you were born, but it's it's probably not in print anymore. But you can get it. At, you can get it at the library, I'm sure. Read it. You find it interesting. When you're looking at a company, do you rely yes. solely on historical financials and the annual report, or do you do a lot of outside research? I like the buy stock selling below book value. It gives me a certain amount of protection. I also like stocks that don't have much debt. That gives me a certain amount of protection. Then you look at the company itself. Well, the company may not be a great company, but if it's got a lot of book value and, and uh, the management, well, and you look back for the last 20 years, uh, you'll see. Now, uh, in this art article that I wrote in Forbes, which you might get hold of, I used about six stocks. I gave it examples of the stocks I recommend or thought they were okay. And, you know, and you, you can disagree with them, but at least uh, I put them down. And uh, so you see if you can get hold of it. Forbes, February 11th issue of... Uh, of the issue, and, and as I say, there's an article there about me. So uh, it, it, it may help you see where I've come from. I don't know where I'm going, but I know where I came from. I, I wanted to just ask you a quick question about uh, more along the industry lines that you enjoy. You mentioned in the past that you like to avoid industries that you're not comfortable with, but I was wondering how you become comfortable with a, a particular industry that you might have some interest in? I'm not quite sure I got the question, but I'll try to answer it. Tell me if I'm mistaken. I kind of like companies that manufacture goods, basically. I think I, if you ask me, do you buy an airline stock? No, I haven't, but I don't know enough about the airlines. And, you know, the airlines is an area where it's been had fabulous growth. But, but it, the stockholders never did very well with it. So uh, getting a growth stock is not always helpful uh, if you can't, if, 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 it, if it doesn't come out so that you can make some money out of it. Uh, so I've tried to buy companies which had simple capitalizations. They had stocks and they had debt. And you want very little debt. And then you look back over the last 20 years, you see of what the company has done, and then, and then get an annual report. One of the things I really don't want to do is get in a company that's got a, the management, I won't say it's crooked, but I'll just say that it's, it's not ethical. You try to stay away from people that, uh, that are out to maybe to take advantage of you. And it's your money or your money that you're managing. You've got a responsibility, and then when you have a responsibility, you have to act responsibly and and I like uh, I like the only uh, buying of stock which is protected on the downside and you usually that usually is a stock where the outlook is not good then again then you'd have to look at it but I would use it I'd use value line as an example so you can get a picture of, of, of where the stock was 10 years ago uh, where the book value is uh, uh, what the debt structure is, then send for the annual report if you're interested, because there are an awful lot of security analysts out there now, and I think a lot of them run by the computer. And uh, the computer doesn't think, it just gives you what you want to hear. You, it, it's there, but I like the idea of, of, of people being at the end of the uh, thing rather than just numbers. I don't know if that helps you at all. The uh, point is you don't want to lose money. You don't want to lose money and you have a client's and responsibility and you're very important. And them with a very philosophical man, he, he, he writes, I think, The Intelligent Investor is a great book. I want Buffett says the greatest book he ever read. But he wrote intelligently and unemotionally. And I think those are good qualities to have in investments. It may not be good in some other field. But if you lose money, it's very upsetting to you and your client. So you try to protect yourself, and one way to do it is to buy, buy stocks which are depressed. And then you want to be sure they're not going to go broke. They want to be they're just an, it's maybe the industry is having troubles. And then you have to weigh that against the opportunities. 
Hello. In Canada, we have a lot of public companies that are family owned. So what do you think about special voting classes of shares? Uh, when I first started working, there were people who had, I remember Easy Washing Machine was an example. They had an A and a B stock, and the A stock with the voting stock, and the B stock was the same, except they had no votes. And those companies have gradually disappeared. There are not many family stocks around. Most of the people, it seems to me, have sold, over the years, have sold their businesses. Uh, I, I I don't know exactly where, you know, a you, family having a, a good business at some point, they want to leave it to their, their family. And generally, I think it's probably better that they sell it because I think that unless the family has got a very bright, you know, grandchildren and so forth will take over. I was always struck by the fact that the Rockefellers, who were really, a, a really intelligent and smart people, I don't think they bought any shares of Berkshire Hathaway. Now, they, you'd think that they would, because this is they didn't need all the income, but it just shows that now Warren is a very brilliant guy. But the problem is that if you wanted income, you didn't get any from him. You, all you got is a capital gain, but if you needed income, uh, and you you and you have to wait 20 years to cash in on it, so that uh, a growth stocks are good for wealthy people. I, I I think that's true, but I like the idea of 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 being able to sell your stock. Now, people who own a business are waiting for the next generation to take it over, and I don't know enough about Canada to know what the tax situations are whether it pays for the family to keep the business or, to, or, or not, because I don't know the inheritance qualities. But, you know, you'd have to know the tax laws, too. But I don't think families over the years have benefited by keeping the business going. I mean, to turn it over to someone else, maybe, but... Okay, well, we're almost out of time. Um, I want to ask you a last question. Uh, which I normally ask to every speaker we had, and this is, what is the most important thing in investing and in life that you have learned over the past 50 or so years? Well, I think honesty is the best thing you can have. It, it just it solves a lot of problems. And uh, just you, when you, you, you have an ethics and you have a problem, and that a lot of comes from the family, I think, basically. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, it, it seems to be a, a good. Just tell the, tell the truth that you don't have to remember. Great. Thank you very much. I don't know. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, this valuable and very informative interaction with my students. Uh, the Value Investing Guest Speaker Series is a critical part of my course as beyond the numbers, my students need to understand the character, the personality, and the temperament of value investors and internalize the character development I'm trying to instill in them. So I really appreciate your helping, your helping me do this and in the process create a memorable experience for me and my value investing students. On behalf of all of us, I will be sending you a small gift, a token of our appreciation, as a memento of this event. Well, thank you very much, and good evening. Well, I'm glad. Thank you very much. I, I don't do this very often, uh, but uh, I think it's probably helpful. It keeps me younger. <laughs> good night. Thank you.